Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, you probably heard that last night the European Space Agency's new spacecraft to Mercury, Bepi Colombo, lifted off from their Ariane Space Center in Kourou in South America. It will take seven years to get to Mercury and will, of course, do all sorts of wonderful science. A lot of people have been asking me questions about this. First of all, who is Bepi Colombo? Why is it named after this individual? Why does it take seven years to get to Mercury? And what is it going to do that Messenger didn't already do? Well, the name Bepi Colombo was decided on back in 1999, before Messenger even launched. Uh, Giuseppe Bepi, or Bepi was his kind of his nickname. Giuseppe Colombo was a professor at the University of Padua in Italy and he studied Mercury and among the things that he you know figured out was he figured out that Mercury had this three to two resonance in its rotation. At that point many people thought that since Mercury was so close to the sun it would be tidally locked and keep always the same face to the sun. But he looking at his orbit and its uh, eccentricity he determined that it would actually have a three to two rotation. So that means that for every two orbits, it would rotate three times or is it every, yeah. Point is that it's locked tidally, but it's not locked into this one to one ratio. Uh, he also came up with the idea of getting a spacecraft to Mercury using a gravity assist at Venus. And of course, the Mariner 10 spacecraft used it. Unfortunately, because of this uh, tidally locked resonance, every time the Mariner passed by Mercury, it was always showing the same side of the planet. So half the planet was in darkness until uh, Messenger, of course, got there to start getting a complete map of the surface. So why does it take seven years? Well, you know, Messenger took five and a half years. The reason is um, that, yes, you can get down there relatively quickly. Parker Solar Probe, for example, is leaving Earth and going down there to the Sun, which is even further away, in two and a bit months. So the thing is, Parker Solar Probe is not stopping. When you're trying to get to a planet, you want to stay in orbit around it. You have to reduce your approach velocity as much as possible. And while, me while uh, you know, Parker Solar Probe could fly by a planet. It doesn't have enough thrust, doesn't have enough fuel to slow down and stop when it gets there. So both with Messenger and Bepi Colombo, they make several gravity assists to slowly lower their orbit down and uh, try to keep it as circular or reduce the eccentricity as much as possible so that when they get to their final capture encounter, they need to use the least amount of fuel possible. Messenger used one gravity assist at Earth, two at Venus, and three at Mercury before making its final orbit insertion uh, using like 2.4 kilometers per second of a uh, delta V that it had. Now, uh, Messenger was a lot smaller than Bepi Colombo, let's be clear. It was like a one ton spacecraft and uh, it was launched into Delta II with an upper kick stage and yes, yeah, spent all that time doing these approaches. Bepi Colombo, on the other hand, is a four ton spacecraft. In fact, it's a four ton spacecraft with multiple parts. Its main interplanetary propulsion system is an ion based thruster. So it doesn't have the high amount of thrust that uh, your chemical thrusters provide, but it can slowly change its orbit. And over the next seven years, between these gravity assists and this ion propulsion system, they're going to get it to a position where it just arrives at Mercury and needs the barest amount of thrust to actually put it into orbit. Now, at that point, it will actually need much higher levels of thrust than the ion thrusters can provide. So it will actually eject this propulsion system and uh, the rest of the spacecraft will go into orbit using conventional chemical propulsion. Now, uh, the actual the rest of the spacecraft is even more complicated. It has two different main components. There's the Mercury Planetary Orbiter and there's Mercury Magnetic Orbiter, uh, or Magnetosphere Orbiter. The Magnetosphere Orbiter has actually been built by Japan. It's going to orbit in a highly eccentric orbit and look at the magnetic field of Mercury, which is of great interest because it's so close to the sun. Mercury has a, you know, it, it's very dense. It's made of high density materials. It's probably got a lot of iron in it. So its magnetic field is apparently really, really interesting. Mercury Planetary Orbiter will eject this into the orbit and then uh, it will then go down into an even lower orbit. Uh, you know, it'll be within a few hundred kilometers of the surface over the entire area. Messenger, by comparison, it went into a highly eccentric capture orbit and then stayed pretty much in that orbit and let the 
uh, you know, let the perturbations of gravity change the orbit over time. So it was only ever getting really close looks at the northern hemisphere. When it flew out into the southern hemisphere, it would be a long way away. One of the reasons it did this, by the way, was not just to reduce the fuel requirements, but also to reduce the uh, thermal pressures on it. When they were close to Mercury, the heat radiating back from Mercury would mean that the spacecraft had to handle more heat. Um, by doing this, it meant that they could cut down on the thermal control hardware and save on Delta V. So Bepi Colombo was like, no, we're gonna go into a proper low Mercury orbit and really examine this thing. And so yeah, it's gonna have two spacecraft, tons of instruments, it's gonna get much better surface details. There was actually another payload which was examined but then dropped from consideration. They were, they were gonna put a lander on the surface with a seven kilogram scientific payload. That never happened, which is a shame because it would have been nice to know a bit about that. Um, also interesting to note is if you look at the orbit of Messenger, because it was in this highly eccentric orbit, the tidal effects of the sun coupled with the orbit of the of Mercury, they formed what they they basically would twist the orbit over time using something called the Kozai mechanism. That's a Yoshido Kozai, I believe, came up with this. It's been a well studied process by which satellite spacecraft orbits will adjust over time. And although there was no atmosphere at Mercury, Messenger's orbit slowly decayed because it was twisted around and eventually it's periapse, or perihermion, I believe is what they call it for Mercury, came inside the planet and it crashed. Bepi Colombo has um, you know, two, three years of lifespan, potentially. It could get more. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how long this lasts. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. But yeah, 2025 is when it finally enters into orbit. Before then, it is gonna collect data as it flies by Venus. It's going to collect data as it flies by Mercury several times. And uh, yeah, so it will be keeping us posted on its grand voyage. But until 2025, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>